So, let's review before we uh, jump into this week's topic. Um, what did we say grace was last week? How did we define it? Well, two weeks ago you said it was unmerited favor. Okay. Gifts. Sorry? Gifts. Um, Generosity of God. That's the one I was looking for. Uh, grace, we said, is just kind of a fancy church word for generosity when you boil it down to its simplest terms. Uh, the word is defined as goodwill, loving kindness, favor, and acceptance, and we just kind of generically called all that generosity. Um, we noted that there is a strong connection between this idea of, of grace or generosity and gifts. Uh, so much so that the word charisma, which means gifts in Greek, the root word for that is the word charis, which is translated grace. So, real strong connection. And, and we're going to be reading some more passages tonight that in the, same, in the same verse that mentions grace, we see the word gift. So, even... Even as we're reading about grace, it's hard to get away from this idea of gift or gifts. Um, we talked about how that grace or generosity is, is a character trait of God. And we talked about how that this idea of God's grace or God's generosity saves us. Do you remember uh, how we d decided that generosity can actually save in Ephesians 2 8 we, we talked about okay <laughs> Brian <laughs> Brian it looks like he's dying to yell out the answer back there no <laughs> okay generosity I think saves us in the sense that this was what motivated God it was his loving kindness it was his desire to, be, to bestow eternal life upon us that caused him to take whatever action was necessary to accomplish that. Now, starting tonight, we're going to look at the role of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. And what, if the schedule holds, what I want us to do is tonight look at the fact that it is the Holy Spirit that gives us eternal life. And then next week, we'll look at the Spirit's work in transforming, transforming us. Now, obviously, this is not the only two things that the Spirit does, but for the purpose of this class, that's what I want to focus on. Um, if you guys don't get anything else out of this class, I hope you'll remember what grace is. That it's God's favor, His loving kindness, His generosity towards us. And, and the fact that that has moved Him to take some sort of action, which we said was ultimately Jesus' sacrifice so that we could have eternal life. And what I want to, or what I hope to demonstrate tonight is that the fact that we have the Spirit living inside us um, is what guarantees our salvation. And we're going to develop this idea in future weeks, but as long as we have the Spirit living inside us, we are saved. We won't finish that idea tonight, but we will get started on it. Christians, because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Christians always have the source of eternal life living inside them. Let's read Acts 2.38, or somebody just recite it. <laughs> Acts 2.38. I'm sorry? Let me start with what Peter said to him, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Doris never looked down at the page. <laughs> at what point do we obtain the forgiveness of our sins? It's, it's not a trick question. Right then, at, at baptism? At what point does the Holy Spirit come to live inside us? At the same time. Is the timing of these two things just a coincidence? God's plan, I'm certain. Okay. What's the relationship then 
do, do we think we can identify what the relationship is between the forgiveness of our sins and the Holy Spirit living inside us? Is there... So you're saying there's cause and effect then? Okay. So one causes the other? Okay. When our bodies are purified from the cleansing of sin, then it provides a place for the Spirit to live. Okay. And I want to look at, let's go ahead and turn to John 4. We're going to look at verses 9 through 14. What I want to suggest, or well, more than suggest, what I want to propose tonight is that it is the indwelling of the Spirit that results in our eternal life. It gives us our salvation, cleanses of, of our sins, and it is the Spirit living within us that gives us the, the eternal life that we desire. Um, who wants to read verses 9 through 14 of John 4? Eric, you want to read it? Verses 9 through 14? Mm-hmm. All right. So the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, who are a Jew, are requesting a drink from me, who is a Samaritan woman? For the Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Yesu responded to her and said, If you were aware of God's freely given gift, and who it is who says to you, Give him drink, you would have requested from him that he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Master, you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. So then where do you have that living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? who gave us this well and drank out of it himself and his sons and his livestock. Yesu responded to her and said, Whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again. Yet whoever drinks the water that I will give him will under no circumstances be thirsty, even to the last age. But the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water that is leaping up into the life of the last age. Okay. I believe what Jesus is teaching here, and what I hope to, to prove with another verse in just a moment, is that the Spirit that lives inside us is this living water that Jesus is speaking of to the Samaritan woman. Let's, let's look at some characteristics of this, of this living water. There's four of them. Jesus gives it. Once you've received it, you never thirst for it again. And why does the text say that We'll never thirst for it again once we've received it. Because it's like a spring, so basically it just keeps flowing. Okay. It creates a, a spring or a fountain of living water within the recipient, so it's, it's always there, right? And this spring or fountain of living water produces eternal life. Now, the, the living water itself, I don't think, is talking about salvation but it's something that produces salvation. Now how can we be sure that the living water refers to the Spirit? Do any other passages come to mind that would help us? And it's going to fulfill the prophecies about not only would it be the Hebrews who would be able to benefit from salvation, but as God promised Abraham, it was going to be a blessing to all the nations, right? Let's look at uh, John 7, 37 through 39. John Short, would you read that for us? John 7, 37 through 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as in the Scripture said, from his 
In their most being will flow the rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was given in the Lord. Okay, so John here really spells it out for us, doesn't he? That, that the living water is the Spirit. So, <clears throat> I think this is what Paul meant in 2 Corinthians 6 when he said, who, made, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So it... It is the Spirit that gives us life. We receive that at baptism when our sins are washed away. And it produces within us the source of eternal life. It is the Spirit who gives us this free gift. And what I hope we're going to start to get out of this is that because Christians have the source of eternal life living inside us, as long as the Spirit is there, we should be able to have some assurance or more assurance that we are in fact saved in spite of the fact that we don't always do exactly the things we would like to do. Yes? Can we have the living Spirit within us and decide not to partake of that living water? Decide not to partake of it. Um, yes. Um, I think if, if we're on the same wavelength, and my, to my way of thinking, to decide not to partake of it is ultimately to reject eternal life. Um, I'm not sure if that's where you're going with it or not. I think so. That's what I was going to say. That would be quenching the Spirit. Right. Uh, and that is something we're going to talk about later, uh, not today, but later in the quarter. Uh, yes, just because the Spirit is living in us right now, and that we have access to that living water right now, does not mean that we can't reject that and not partake of it, and quench the Spirit, fail to partake of the living water, and reach a point where, you know what, the Spirit's not in us anymore. And at that point... Um, I don't think that, uh, I think the Bible bears out that we have lost our salvation. The problem that a lot of us have, though, is, is that we feel like the Holy Spirit comes and goes like somebody stuck in a revolving door. Um, many of us, or some of us, have this idea, well, I sinned, so now I'm lost. The Holy Spirit has left. I've lost my salvation until I repent, confess my sin to God, and pray for forgiveness. Uh, again, that's not something we're going to look at today. I think, uh, if memory serves, we'll start looking at that idea a little bit more closely week after next. But I don't believe there's any scripture to support this idea, that, that we have intermittent salvation. Today we have it, tomorrow we don't. And today, then we have it again, then we don't. Let's look at Romans chapter 5 verses 15 through 17. Lena, would you mind to read that? Romans 5, 15 through 17. You know, in that, in those, what, three verses, this idea of a free gift is mentioned five times. What is the free gift? Okay, I think it's something the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us. Salvation. Uh, Romans 6.23 
For the wages of sin is death, but the, th but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And <clears throat> there's a contrast in this verse that I didn't notice for the longest time. It's rather obvious, actually, but I didn't see it. Do you see the contrast here between wages and a gift? The wages of sin is death, but this gift we receive of eternal life is, is a free gift. Now, why is eternal life a gift? You can't earn it. God had to give it to us because there was nothing that we could do to merit it. We, we can earn death real easy, but there's nothing we can do to earn eternal life. And that's why it's a gift. I don't know your backgrounds, but in the churches that I was in prior to coming here about seven years ago, there wasn't much talk in our circles about this idea of a free gift. Um, it there was a lot of talk and some of you are maybe familiar with it about that we have to have faith of the right kind combined with works of the right kind. Anybody heard that before? I know Eric has. We went to the same church. <laughs> So it, it was an attempt at reconciling James and Paul. And obviously the Bible is very clear that we have to have faith. But, but Christians are also made for good works, right? The Bible says so. And in the background that Eric and I have, and maybe some of the rest of you, the reconciliation was it takes both. That I have to have faith to get saved, and then I have to do the right kinds of good works to stay saved. How does that gel with what we just, with what we just talked about? How does that gel with it being a, the idea of a free gift? Does it work? Why not? Well, if you put down that you have to do works to earn it, then it's not a gift. It's, you're, you're working toward it. And, and that's the interesting thing. And, the one thing that I, I think you would agree with, the, the statement that I came up with, at least for myself, was, you know, I don't do good works to earn my salvation. I do good works because I'm a Christian. It, it, it's something I do based upon the salvation that's in me. I don't do it to earn my salvation. Okay. Times? I think I go to an example. Makes it clear to me. Chicken lays an egg. I like I like your illustrations. I'm gonna try to remember that. Austin? It seems to me that um, choosing not to have faith and choosing not to do works would be rejecting the gift. I, I was kinda hesitant to kind of see it as a free gift because it seems like there's a cost in the way you choose to live. But in the of seeing it as a, a gift of salvation. Uh, John? I've come to recognize that it is another feature or facet of grace. Uh, Paul talks at length about uh, grace being that which uh, gives, lets elders be better elders and people who teach better teachers. He goes into that quite in, at length, even those who contribute to contribute with more generosity and that is what he called grace and he equated it to the idea that uh, a, a conquering warrior is going to bring great uh, gifts to his homeland 
to his home people. And he brought them from on high. And, the, and then it goes on to the litany of all the task items that this grace is part of, is a feature of, and it includes all these services. Okay. Al? Two things. One, uh, I'm sure we'll get to the fruit of the Spirit. If we are building and developing within the context of the fruit of the Spirit, those attributes will make it perfectly desirable and natural to do the works that we are talking about here. Second thing is, in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, in Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and death. I don't know that I've ever heard anyone preach a sermon on the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But that's what we're talking about. This Spirit of life in Christ. That's walking in the light in the Spirit. And I'm about to skip ahead a little bit for, to next week, but I think as we are transformed by the Spirit to be more and more like Christ, uh, these things that we do are not these works, so to speak, good works that we do, is not something we're doing just to keep the rules so that we can go to heaven. It becomes part of who we are. And like Al says, it just flows out naturally because we're becoming, hopefully, more like God, and therefore we should be doing things that resemble God. Right. Could I, could I read Romans sure. 12, verse 6, starting? Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our service, or in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who <coughs> contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Those, these are all, all features of grace given. So by, by God, because of God's generosity, He's giving us gifts with, that can help equip us, equip the church to go about the mission that we're supposed to be doing. I think it, it's hard at first blush for many of us to think, wow, that's great, you gave me a, a job, you know, <laughs> thanks a lot. But really, I think when we finally get to see the full picture, we're going to understand what truly a gift it was that we could actually serve in the kingdom. Haley, do you have a comment? And what I've had to learn, to use your example, you know, a peach tree to make a peach isn't straining and struggling to squeeze out a, a peach bud, is it? It just happens naturally. Um, it's not something the tree has to work at real hard. It's something the tree does because it's a tree and or barks because it's a dog or lays an egg because it's a chicken. Uh, Leanne? Rather than I need to work. 
Yeah, and I don't think any of us even understand how the Spirit does the transforming work that it does, right? Nor do we need to. Um, is that what we call, what we've always called providence, which is not in the Bible? Uh, the, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know where the word providence of God came from, but it's not in any version of the scripture that I know of. But I think we've attached that term to the con or that concept to the whole matter of the grace of God. Just an idea. Um, just one thing. Um, you know, you all were talking about, you know, how the Spirit works it within you. Well, a lot of times, you know, I don't know about you all, but sometimes whenever I want to help somebody out, you know, it just calls to, to, to go and help someone. And I think that's just the natural instinct of, of the Holy Spirit. Well, the, as we're transformed, certainly, you know, we should become more helpful people. Um, I could tell you all kinds of stories about how, I, how unhelpful uh, I used to be, or Melinda would say I am, uh, <laughs> if she were here, and she's not. <laughs> but um, I think when you start to understand and recognize that the Holy Spirit is working within us, He is bringing about change, as opposed to some abstract idea that I don't know what it's there for, but God says it's there, so, you know, whatever. Well, the Bible tells us that during our baptism, when we're baptized, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. I mean, if that's not an action word, I don't know what it is. All right. And that's a continual gift of grace is living water. And to me, it's almost better if I just say God is in us. Because we see the Holy Spirit, and it's like we try to separate Him all the time. And that's like God's voice within me. You know, the Holy Spirit, it's active, it's within me, it's living God. Well, the Holy Spirit is God. Exactly. So when we, when we try to separate, sometimes it's almost like we're talking about a separate entity and not really getting the full justification of it, that God is in yeah, I think in general it's just hard to wrap your head around. I mean, just the idea of being separate but one. And you know what the good... Standing alone, that's why we're separate. You know what the really good thing is, though? We don't have to get it for it right. to work, right? <laughs> and that, isn't that a good thing? Yeah. It is for me, Dwight. There's a term that we use for people that, uh, that you might say a person is unnatural at doing something that might be an athlete or being a speaker or whatever their profession is. Uh, John was reading these verses a minute ago, but one verse beyond in Romans 12, 9, it says, that love be genuine. And if something is easy, if it's a natural force, then we're going to continue to do it. We're not going to have to force ourselves to do it, and we're going to be a whole lot better at it. We may not be a natural in the beginning, but we could, the more we concentrate on it and increase our love for God, then we will become a natural. Now, last week we talked about Ephesians 2 8 and how that we've been saved by grace, and we talked about it in what respect or what regard that grace saves us. The second part of that idea is that we've been, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith. I want to take a little bit of a detour here that I think is worthwhile. We are saved by grace, which I guess we could say is God's part, but it takes faith on our part too, right? We, we know that, that God is not pleased with those who do not have faith. But what is faith? Is it just believing that He exists, or is there something more to it than that? Maybe it's like what Haman was saying, it's a submission. It, it, it's, it's a more of, of not only do I believe, but I submit to your authority, I submit to your leadership, your direction. I think there, there's definitely a component of that. Um, we, we are used to using the word faith with the idea of just, uh, just believing. I believe that God exists. And we really, really need more lessons, I think, to reinforce the idea that it is that, but it's not just that. The way the Bible uses the word faith, it is the idea of believing, trusting, and faithfulness, loyalty. Let's, let's look at that a little bit more. 
the um, the Greek word that's translated faith is pistis. And what I want to do is look at a few verses that where that Greek word is used. It's always either translated faith or faithfulness. But I, I want to draw out how that faith is not just believing. Let's look at uh, James 2.19. Uh, Dwight, would you read that one? You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe in the shudder. Okay. So again, I won't dwell on that much because we understand that faith means to believe. Um, and we can see that here in this passage. Even the, even the demons have faith in that they know that God exists. Let's also look at Luke 8, 24 and 25. Um, Nancy, would you read that for us? Luke 8, 24 and 25. So what was the problem here? What what is Jesus really asking? Is he saying, "Where is your faith is and why don't you believe in me?" Or did he mean it in another way? Don't you think trust? Why don't you trust me? I'm here in the boat with you. I said we were going to the other side, and now you've, you've lost faith. Your, your trust is not what it should be. Uh, Romans 4, 9. Romans 4, 9. I'll read that one. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. The context here is that because Abraham trusted in God and trusted in his promises, he was considered righteous. So again, the idea of faith here is, is trust. And then there's the idea of being faithful or faithfulness. Uh, let's look at Romans 3.3. 3. Emily, would you read that? What if some were unfaithful? Does their faith, faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? All right. So here it's talking about the faithfulness of God. And same word that we've been looking at, same word in the Greek. And here we're looking at God is going to keep His promise. He's going to be faithful to do what He said He was going to do, even though, in the context of Romans 3, the Israelites had failed on their end. God was faithful to keep His promise. He was going to be loyal to the deal He made with them. And let's look at one more, Galatians 5.22. Speaking of the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Stephanie, would you read that? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Faithfulness. Again, this idea of loyalty. So, faith... When we hear the word faith, I think what we should try to work for is to realize it's not just talking about believing. It's talking about trusting God to do what He said He would do. And it's the idea of us being loyal to Him, doing what He wants, to, wants us to do. I, I like charts. Helps me out. If we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, we're accepting that Jesus is the Messiah, right? Likewise, if we trust Jesus to keep His promises, we're acknowledging that He's our Savior. He's going to save us just like He said He would. We can trust that. And if Jesus is Lord, and we recognize Him and accept Him as our Lord, we're going to have to be faithful to Him. We're going to have to obey what He says. And this implies repentance. We're going to have to turn our backs on sin, turn our face towards God, and do what we know our Lord would want us to do. So in this idea of faith, it's not only believing, but trusting, 
and being faithful, being obedient. Now, I'm throwing this in just because I thought it was interesting. <laughs> Has nothing really to do with, with grace necessarily, but believing, uh, we just said, is, is faith. But trusting in Jesus to keep His promises is hope. And hope isn't just something we wish for, like I wish that, you know, somebody would leave me a million dollars. Hope is, is desiring something combined with the expectation that I'm, I'm really going to get it. And then to be faithful, to recognize that Jesus is Lord, is to love Him. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? So if we love Jesus, love God, we're going to do what He says. Faith, hope, and love. I just thought that that was interesting, how that all kind of matched up and fit in. Now, we're not going to talk, we're going to, we're going to run out of time, so we're not going to go here, but if John, y'all can blame John, because I think a couple of weeks ago he said, give us homework. <laughs> so here's your homework. It's not hard. Just think about it. <clears throat> Be thinking about, and we've talked about it some already, why is it that we sometimes feel so strongly that we have to obey to remain saved? So just we're going to develop that idea later. Uh, we've, we've talked about it some. We know that we obey because it is part of who we're becoming. But there are, there are many who feel like, I have to have faith of the right kind and works of the right kind. And part of that is obeying. And when I don't obey perfectly, I'm lost. So, yes? Something that's haunted me is since last week. I want you to tell me that I didn't understand what you said. I'm afraid of what you're going to say now. <laughs> Go ahead. statement that you asked that over We, we did a show of hands. I don't know how. I, I didn't count, but just glancing out, yes. Less than half raised their hands saying they were sure of their salvation. They were, they were sure. Okay. Less than half. So more than half was unsure. Are you still haunted? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hang out with me. This is a 13-week television series that is continued each week. And I'm hoping that by the end, all of this will just roll together and, you know, as I said, be patient. A lot of these lessons are not standalone. They're meant to be built upon one another. Be thinking about why you, well, be thinking about why you think it is that some people believe that if they don't have perfect obedience, they're lost each time that they mess up. Maybe some of you think that, maybe some of you don't. Um, just be thinking about that, because we are going to talk about it. Eric? That's it. <laughs> I'm glad you're in here. You're helping me out with my illustrations. <laughs> Tightrope Christians. Eric? Uh, what I was going to bring up, um, when I used to teach the high school class, one of the debates we had, we, we would play uh, devil's advocate, basically just turn it to a debate. But something that I brought to their attention that would even make, I think, some of the people in this room think about it is, is, you know, people who have this mindset, if you truly think about it, you know, what if you're driving down the road, you broke the speed limit, and, you know, you just done something at work that uh, was unlawful, whatever it may be. And then you wreck and die, but you didn't have a chance to ask for forgiveness. For Does that mean you lost? Did you have an opportunity to repent? Uh, another one that I know we, I talked about with somebody is, is uh, this is somewhat of a sad story, but there was a brother in Christ that uh, went to church with for years, and uh, they put him on antidepressants, and uh, even noted on the medicine that he was supposed to be monitored. Uh, but uh, the medicine made him have suicidal thoughts and killed himself. And there were people who thought because of that that he was lost. And you have to think about that. Here's somebody who's been a Christian their entire life and they take some medication and, and then that happens. 
you know, is that one sin going to keep them from heaven? And, and then you kind of put yourself in that shoes. What if I do something wrong and I don't get a chance to repent? Is our salvation really that weak? And I, I heard a preacher, it may have been the same situation, preach that a person who had committed suicide was lost. He, so, Joy? It's funny that Titus said that about the typo because when you were talking about trust a while ago, the first thing I thought about was somebody that walks the typo. And you know what? They don't get up there every night and think I might fall off. I mean, they go just... They're very sure of themselves and they trust that they can do it. And so I, I think that trusting in God is like sometimes working the tightrope because if you're sure of yourself, you'll stay right on there. Don't look down. Don't look down. <laughs> <laughs> but they've done it so many times. All right. You know, they don't get up there and wiggle and bubble and say, oh, my fall off. Do you remember this from, was it last week? Yeah, it was last week. We looked at this idea of grace and how that motivated that was the motivating factor for God to take action. Let's let's fill this out now that we've talked a little bit more about what faith is. If we're saved by grace through faith, and faith is a very significant portion of what how we um, obtain that grace. What is the significance or what's the point of baptism? We're saved by grace through faith. Where's baptism fit in here? In three minutes or less. Faith comes by hearing the word. Okay. Okay. I'm not because we are running out of time, I'm not gonna make you guys walk a tightrope here. That's the first expression, maybe first, but it's an expression of this faith. Trust. Okay. You see, the promise is that with baptism, sins will be forgiven, the Holy Spirit will be the gift, and you trust that message. You trust God to be faithful to the message. So you have a, a considerable measure of trust in doing the baptism. Let's look at this chart. Let's fill it out. If grace was the motivating factor. God's generosity was the motivating factor in taking action and it resulted in Jesus' sacrifice. And that was, I guess, for lack of a better word, his side of the equation. I, I would suggest that likewise faith, believing, trusting, and being obedient, faithful, is the motivating factor on our part that causes us to want to obey and become baptized. And I would suggest that one way to look at baptism is, is that is, so to speak, the signal flare to God that says, God, I want to accept the free gift. And that is the point in time at which our sins are forgiven, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside us. And coming back to where we started, the Holy Spirit is the living water. It's a fountain of continuous water that produces salvation. And because we have this fountain of living water inside us, and it's continuous, we'll never thirst for it again. We have salvation as long as we have the Spirit. Christians always have the source of eternal life living inside them. And we're at an excellent stopping point because next is we're going to talk about the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. And after that, the week after that, we're going to talk a little bit about when Christians can lose the Spirit. Thanks for all your comments. If you guys didn't talk, I would run out of material in about 20 minutes. <laughs> Thanks a lot.